Now, I don't usually know where the heat's coming from when I'm in a building. Uh, it's just, it's here. It's warm. And if it's not, I ask somebody else to fix it. <laughs> Can't do that here. We have, uh, let's see, does that go down? I'm hoping it does. There it is. Okay, I can do that. Our, our building has really three buildings. There's the, uh, the church, which was uh, completed in 19, 1896. The uh, parish house over here was uh, rebuilt in 1950. There's a fire in the original one. Mm -hmm. And so this is what I'm told is the, the parish house rebuilt. And then in the back is the Trinity House. And that was built in 1964. We're in it right now. So we'd probably be up in the corner there. Let's see, I probably have a, a cursor. Yes, I do. So we're probably, oh, come on. About here. <laughs> That's the <laughs> common room. Just to give you an idea. Now, the heating system uh, is really three systems. Um, let's say two. There's a steam, steam heat goes to the church and the parish house, and Trinity House has hot water heat. So this is just hot water baseboards. Sometimes they're baseboards, sometimes they're up a little bit. But uh, that's basically what gets use here. This is a steam radiator. And uh, many of us have forgotten what they look like, but <laughs> this one happens to be in the undercroft, and it was exposed, so I, I use this one. This, uh, this system runs on hot steam. The hot steam enters up here, goes out into these uh, radiator elements, and as it cools down and condenses, it gives off heat. To the area around it. So it really heats these iron portions. When the steam uh, cools off, it condenses, turns back into water. And that uh, ends up down at the bottom here. And the steam pressure pushes it out through the bottom, which is, uh, we'll call that um, condensate. condensate. I was missing that one. So uh, I'm trying to teach you everything I know. I didn't know a great deal about this when I started. <laughs> but in the last six months or eight months, we've all learned a good deal, everybody on the committee. We have some committee members here. We've got Peter over there. Um, let's see, who else is on the committee? I guess uh, David. And we often get Michael out. <laughs> so I'm trying to tell you everything we've learned. This is the steam boiler. It's pretty good size. I probably should have stood next to it. But my head would probably come up to almost the top of it. But it's pretty good size. Um, water enters through the back. Uh, it's heated up to steam, which is 212 degrees. And then it takes a little extra power to turn it into steam as well. Uh, that's sent out. The steam is sent out to the radiators, which you had on the last screen, uh, via iron pipes. Now, some of these iron pipes are a little bit older, um, probably 1936 or so is what we're estimating. So they're quite old. Uh, iron does uh, rust off little by little from inside. And we're getting a lot of rust coming in. There's a place here, where you can see the water. It's a sight glass. It's hard to see it. It's just a, about 12 inches long. And we can tell what the water looks like inside and how much pressure is in there. We want to regulate that. So these are quite high maintenance, these boilers. You can't just let them run. Every now and then we have to release some of the, the crud that builds up in it which would be rust and uh, particles. And that comes out, let's see, there's a pipe over here, one pipe, there's another one there, and they dump into a floor drain. Um, we have, to, this is called blowing down the boiler. I have no idea where that 
term came from. But we blow down the boiler oh, three or four times a week. And Michael's been doing it quite a lot lately. He's, he's getting good at it. <laughs> and he has a, a chart that shows what days he's blown down the boiler. The, uh, some of the folks that come in and talk to us have said, you should blow it, blow it down every day. Well, we'll do the best we can. You know, three or four times a week isn't too bad. The boiler was installed in 2008. Um, it's made of a lot of different components that are like slices, and they push, put them all together. And we had a little trouble with it at first. I think one of the parts were bad. So we had to send it back, bring it back again. Our, our uh, mechanical guys put it all back together again, and it finally worked. This is called a peerless boiler. Peerless is uh, probably up here on the name somewhere, but you can't see it. I don't remember where they're made. Do you? Okay. So that's the brand name. That's, that's the brand, brand name. name. Right. The water to fill the boiler comes from what we call the condensate return uh, tank. That's where the, the heated water ends up back in here after it's gone through the steam heaters and condensed. And so we collect it back in here. Um, I'm told it's a, let's see, the sit, ooh, okay, the water must be added if it's lower. So you check the level of this and add city water as required. Does uh, it automatically. Does it automatically, right. Um, I'm told that it's a very tight system since, uh, let's see, it says, uh, I don't know. Since we turned it on this fall, we've used about five gallons of makeup water. Wow. So we're not adding much back into the system. Unfortunately, the water we're adding back into the city, <laughs> city water, that has a lot of chlorine mm -hmm. to clean it up. It's river water. So they have to add a lot to kill off all the bacteria. And the chlorine begins to kind of excites the rusting. So that the rust is created mostly by those. And we have a company that comes and treats the water once a month. And uh, they test the amount of electrolytes in it and test for some other chemicals. And then they'll add a shot into the uh, condensate, tank, which will help reduce the, the rust buildup and so on. However, the electrolytes have been so high recently, we haven't been able to add anything to it. If the electrolyte count is way up there, they won't even try to condition it. But you have so that. where are where are all these located in the building? Uh, they're in the furnace room. This is underneath the kitchen. Underneath yeah, the kitchen. Right. Okay. There what's under here? I don't, don't know what's under here. There isn't much. It's just a slab. Following the floor. <laughs> if you'd like to. <laughs> this is you, a slab. Yeah, you go down into the basement. There's a, a stairway. Right across from the kitchen entrance down here. Oh, okay. And that takes you down a long set of stairs. And then you take another long set of stairs into the boiler room. So it's well below so the dungeon. Level. The dungeon. So it's like there's two basements there. Oh, yeah. Yeah, this is the sub basement. Yeah. And it's right below the kitchen. So, yeah, that's where all this stuff is. Let's see. What else I have to say about that? Is there a sediment problem in the uh, condensation? Yeah, um, it's actually, it goes through the condensate tank and goes back into the main boiler and then settles. So, so I, I assume you have to clean the sediment out at some point. Yeah, that's what we I told you about blowing it down. You drain. Not in there. Not in this tank. Not in this tank. This is a fairly new tank. We're going backward here. Same idea exactly. Just get all the, the junk out the bottom. Uh, uh, and I said it gets dumped out here. So we, we drain some from on this side. This is what they call the low side. And the high side's around the other side. So that's where the water comes in. And this is at the bottom where it comes, you know, where it can drain the bottom end of it. So Four times a week, we try to drain that out. Uh, maybe 
They said we could do with less of the blowing down if we added a, a water softener and a filter so that the water coming in will not have all the electrolytes. So at the moment, we're pricing out uh, a hot water. It's, it'll just be a, a, a city water uh, softener, and that should help quite a bit. Yes? Is that a non-salt softener? It's a salt softener, but it only, salt. they told me it would probably only take a couple bags. But the salt is not bad for the pipes? But doesn't the salt is what grease the water. You know how to talk about this? Bill? Well, okay. the, no. the brine tank cleans, cleans what filters it. The salt doesn't actually go in the water. Right. The salt and iron was not going to be good. Pardon? Salt and iron is not well, going to be good. Oh, right. Not be, uh, no, it doesn't. It only gets used to recycle the water softener. Okay. So it doesn't ever get into the water. It cleans the filter, basically. Yeah, so, exactly. Okay, I'm told it's a very tight system because we only use five gallons. <laughs> so Maybe five gallons could be from the blowing down. Oh, I suspect so. Sure, we we lose yeah. a gallon or so. A little more than that gallon. Okay, so let's see. Going down a little. This is working better than. Now the condensate is returned uh, gravity feed, and there's also two pumps that uh, collect water. There's two spots that collect water at low points, and then the condensate is pumped up to a higher spot and then continues with the gravity. Hmm. So Especially down in the undercroft. <laughs> in this process also. Most of, most of the radiators are above, you know, this level or above, so it will drain that way. But in oh. the basement, we've got uh, radiators also, and they have to get pumped because they're so low by them. This is, uh, we also have hot water radiators. These are around Trinity House. Maybe if you have some of those in your house. But this is just hot water traveling through a pipe. And there's fins on this pipe. And the fins actually radiate the heat from the hot water that's coming through the pipe. So let's see. So it's much simpler. There's not so much... Um, don't have big tall radiators here. We just have right in to those uh, up. Some of them are right on the floor. Um, the water is heated to about 180 degrees Fahrenheit. That's not by the peerless boiler. There's another boiler. Come on, there we go. This is a Buderis boiler, and this just heats the water. So it's a lot simpler. You don't have to turn it to steam. You heat it to 180 degrees instead of 212. So there's a lot of savings in that. It pumped through the building all the time. So there's water running through here and heating us. Uh, the returns in the furnace at about 160 degrees. Now we have two of these boilers and they back each other up. So one room some of the time and then they switch over and the other one heats for a while. And then this one when it's all done, it starts back up again. There's a lot simpler maintenance. There's no, not worried about the uh, pH of the water going in. And it stays pretty much tight. You know, not much needs to be added, but I can tell. Do we, um, do we know what those pipes are made out of? They're copper. copper. Okay. That's what it looks like. <coughs> so they, you know, and they're much newer. This this it's place was built in the mid sixties. Pardon? Lead free solder. Oh. No. They, they, that was new enough that they didn't. Oh, they did it that way. Yeah, they wouldn't have had lead available. All right. What was the age of this one? Of this oil? These are probably uh, <coughs> two thousand fifteen or so. Okay. So they're quite new. Okay. <clears throat> and then they, uh, they, as I said, there's two of them. So there's probably extra capacity in there. Let's see what's next here. Now that water doesn't go to the uh, the bathrooms or the sinks anywhere. The uh, the house water, as they would call it, comes from this water heater, which is kind of like the ones you got home, but a lot bigger. It's uh, 
right down in the boiler room. And it, it, it takes, uh, you know, water from the city and sends it up through the plumbing. We don't have a lot of line buildup that I know of in any of the buildings. Is that about right? I don't see much lime in the uh, the uh, sinks or other places. So we're not too worried about using city water here. It won't rot out. Uh, most of our pipes are copper going out to the uh, facilities. There's so we're a not... heat exchanger in that. So that uh, blue furnace that he showed you will send heat over to this unit. Uh, in a sealed section, and then that heats up the water in this tank and exchanges the heat into the city water that comes in. That then goes to our um, the sinks oh, and the dishwasher. Now, it goes to the dishwasher, but there's also a heater in the dishwasher. It has to be higher temperature yeah. for the, for the uh, health department. So that has a heater already in it. And so this really goes to the office, <laughs> maybe the bathrooms over here and so on. Um, separate hot water. So it's not the same stuff we're getting from the Bedaris, you know, the big blue boiler. Um, offices have their own water heater up there in a closet. So they that doesn't need to be on. We had this turned off all summer. Didn't need it. No, but well, we would have if we had canteen, but we didn't. Yeah. So right. Well, as I said, the the dishwasher heats the water also, so you don't really have to send it hot water to begin with. Clear Commission Health Department regulations for people washing their hands at a certain time. Ah, okay. And I'm not totally familiar, and I wasn't going to make a lot of wave on that one. <laughs> so we, we started this back up in the fall, and we started the other boilers. A few facts. Let's see. This kind of leads into uh, what Peter will tell us. So we've already talked about uh, two main systems, the steam heat and the hot water. Um, the steam heating system is old. I'm not too sure. I was saying 1936 maybe, but it could be even older than that since the building's that old. Um the steam heats the church, the parish house, and the gym, and the hot water is Trinity House. The annual bill for heating is about $25,000 last year. So it's not cheap. And that includes everything. That's both systems. Um, so we, were, we don't know enough about this, to be honest. Since we're close to end of life on the steam heat, at least the pipes, well, I think boil is just fine. New enough doesn't seem to be too bad, but the pipes may be getting to end of, end of life. Uh, now we had a big use of water back uh, December of 21 through February of 22. We used 81,000 gallons, and I went looking for the swimming pool in the basement. I couldn't find it. <laughs> That's a lot of water. There was a leak. That's right. I don't know where it was. We had the water department come over and walk through with Frank, and they checked all the places water gets used and did not find a leak. Not to that extent. No. Not the 81,000 gallon. We do have leaks on occasion. Yeah. Which I need to mention the number. Yeah. <laughs> I know where it is. <laughs> but we've been going through and replacing pipe, uh, iron pipe that's accessible. Device. Now we've had we placed some down the, in the Haven, mm -hmm. or the Undercroft, mm -hmm. and we also uh, had replaced a steam valve up in the uh, third floor. Oh, so we've had some repairs in the last few years, but that not, not general. You know, there wasn't going to leak eighty-one thousand gallons in three months. Yeah, we haven't seen it since. People in the building have been able to find the leaks fairly quickly and mm -hmm. address them and get on. But we don't know where all that water went or if for some reason the meter was reading wrong. But it seems to be working now. It's way less water coming through. So we're not quite sure what to do about all that information. So we had we commissioned an engineering study 
by a company called uh, um, Watson Engineering. They're out in Wego on Route 17C. They have to go past the Hiawatha Bridge you know, for a little further along. And they're right on 17C. Uh, it's a young company. The uh, fellow that runs it used to teach thermodynamics on West Point. <laughs> That's John Evangelista. Uh, I'm out of my charts. I'm going to let Peter do some. Can I just continue with uh, your yeah. file? Or? Okay, thank you. Great, thank you. So I uh, know you have a heads up here. This major water event last uh, December and spring uh, that made the uh, Building and Grounds Committee uh, take notice and start learning, learning a lot <laughs> about the heating systems uh, in the church and understanding that we've got two systems, totally different steam, hot water, one just for the Trinity House, the other the steam system for everything else. And uh, the questions we've been wrestling with is what do we do with that? Uh, the age of the steam system alone uh, <laughs> suggests that it may be reaching end of life. Is it going to go plop on us tomorrow? Hopefully not. <laughs> but uh, we took notice that uh, this is not something that we want to keep sitting. Um, if that system goes, given its size and complexity, we are looking at several months runway to uh, do a major repair on it. Some of the piping is encased in concrete. We can't even get to it. So we have to route around or whatever. And uh, I said, okay, this system was state of the art 60 plus years ago. Wonderful system, puts out a ton of heat, sometimes more than we need, but it's a wonderful system that reflects the state of the art 60 years from now. Okay. <clears throat> so here again, you get a quick summary of uh, what we have. The PLS uh, boiler, which is likely hugely oversized. Uh, you know, a, rough, a very rough guesstimate, and I need to emphasize a rough guesstimate from uh, our engineer, suggests that this may be three times the size what we actually need. State of the art 60 years ago, you turn it on, it heats the buildings really fast. But this is not where we want to be nowadays. We think about emissions. We think about uh, creation care and what we do to the environment with that kind of energy consumption. So there's a lot of new things that we take into consideration nowadays if we were to put in a brand new heating system from scratch nowadays. And of course, part of our challenge is the uh, three boilers downstairs, and particularly the PLS steam boiler, isn't all that old. It's got quite a few more years of lifetime in it and of service in it. So uh, the challenge for us isn't uh, just uh, can we start from scratch and start all over, but can we evolve what we have to address the likely soft spots, which is the piping and the radiators, and do it in a way so that when we have that discussion the next time, which is when that PLS steam boiler goes, that we don't at that time find, gee, if in 2023 or 2024, we had done something different, we would now have a much easier time switching that uh, steam boiler for something that's then state of the art. So we are really looking at a bit of a maze here of various routes in which we could evolve that system, trying to understand what is currently good and what would not prevent us from moving to something even better in the future. The things we look at is what the, our engineer calls first cost. That is just bringing in something new, whether it's new piping and radiators or a new uh, boiler or both. First cost is what it takes to bring in portions or all of a new system. 
cost of operations. Now we think by the time we have got the final number for 2022, we're going to be sitting at somewhere around $25,000 for cost of heating the four buildings. And uh, the peerless boiler, of course, that's responsible for three of our buildings is a major part of that. How much of that? We don't know. There is no metering that we can use. But that's uh, one of the questions uh, to think about. We are looking at uh, creation care. Okay, green. Does, does that ring a bell? Environmental consciousness and justice and all those uh, wonderful words. Uh, our bishop likes to refer to all of that as creation care. Taking care of God's creation, which in our case uh, means uh, we need to think about the emissions of the system, both what we produce on site and where the energy comes from. And we need to think about the energy efficiency of our system. Um, is the engineer, is he looking at, I mean, have we gotten to that point where he's looking at how to bridge between the fact that we use the fossil fuels and you and I both know we talked about that they're going to outlaw um, all new construction in New York State when they won't have oil furnaces or gas furnaces. They're all going to be electric, period, end of sentence, by 2025, right? And they're going to outlaw gas stoves by 2027. So, I mean, is there, a, a, does he know, are there bridges between when you've got a system like ours, or you and I've talked, the building, the apartment building we, we live in has the same dilemma. You know, I mean, are there bridges to, to fix that? That's, to bridge between that one and the other? That's part of the discussions we have with him. And I'm going to dig into trust you know, as an example of that. Um, one of the proposals that the engineer has uh, suggested we need to look at is uh, to uh, replace the piping and the radiators in the three buildings, continue to use the PLS boiler, but do a heat coupler between the PLS boiler and those potential uh, piping and radiator replacements. And then down the road, uh, when uh, the peerless boiler goes, well, then uh, it gets replaced by another heat source. At that time, we are looking 10, 15 years down the road. It's probably a heat pump. And then that gets uh, hooked up directly to the uh, heating but system. The, the right. But, you know, but, but you need to do one thing at a time. Yeah, there are considerable uh, amounts of money involved here, and we need to be stewards of all of them. The current sweet spot for residential or smaller buildings uh, is a heat pump system with natural gas backup. So, you know, stash that away in the back of your mind. We are nowhere near saying this is appropriate for us here. But anybody who you know, is dealing with, uh, gee, I need to replace a heating system at home, um, that's the current sweet spot. And uh, that is, in fact, what the engineers put into their brand new building. They moved from 17C to 434, the building right next to the uh, hardwood uh, place on 434 in Apple Lake. And if you know that area, um, why did they pick heat pump with natural gas back up when it gets cold? And it's not even a month ago that we were sitting uh, barely above zero here with the wind uh, blasting through every nook and cranny. A heat pump can technically handle that. There's still enough heat energy even around zero degrees Fahrenheit with the wind blasting to move the energy from outside to inside. But it is going to run like all heck broke loose. So it's totally inefficient at that outside temperature. And that's where the uh, natural gas backup comes in. Okay, so that's why that's the sweet spot currently for smaller buildings. I just saw something again in the press. Hey, we got a different way of doing heat pumps and they're even more efficient and even better at extracting heat from very cold outside uh, temperatures. Yeah. Don't uh, a lot of the heat pump, well, I don't know a lot, but um, have pipes also in the ground too, so they get the Instead of getting the heat from the air, they get yeah. the from the ground. That is another like, geothermal heat pump extracting uh, heat energy from the ground. 
um, I think those are the two prevalent uh, models. Water, yeah, but not not for us, not in this area. No, no. So, uh, and I sometimes wonder, by the time every house has a heat pump with either air or groundwater uh, heat sources, what's that going to do to the environment? <laughs> I don't know. It's just sheer speculation. Yeah. And you're transferring heat, not water. Yeah, not yeah. water. Right. Extract heat energy from water and pump it into a building. Ventilation in the church, as we know, is almost non existent. That's, of course, been a challenge recently with uh, trying to keep the air in there healthy with uh, all the ugly stuff going around. And uh, it's going to continue to be a challenge going forward. <clears throat> so what are we thinking about when we uh, try to map out uh, and develop a uh, roadmap? Obviously, we'd like not to have to worry when I come in tomorrow morning for services or office work. Is the heat going to be on? Or where did it spring a new leak? Not quite as catastrophic as the heat is off, but still... We'd like to know that we've got reliable heat. We've got to be good stewards of the heating expense. 25,000 uh, a year says, watch this one. We can save, you know, a penny here and a penny there, but it's the big stuff that makes the real difference. The stewardship of the replacement and repair cost. We could spend in the vicinity of one and a quarter million to uh, get state-of-the-art heating systems into these three buildings. Not going to happen. Don't even think about that. that. It's not going to happen. We need to do something that uh, costs us far less than that. And of course, <clears throat> as I mentioned already, the stewardship of the future. We don't want to create a situation where folks 10, 15 years hence, when that peerless uh, boiler gives up, uh, its spirit when the environment for what's considered state-of-the-art heating systems has totally changed from where we are today. We don't want to tie the hands of those coming in 10, 15 years looking at that, having to say, boy, if only they had done X 10, 15 years ago, like right now or next year. So it's, uh, it's a really complex set of questions. What we are trying to do is develop a roadmap for some of the paths in which our heating system could evolve. This is not quite a complete roadmap. There, there we, we keep getting more questions and ideas. And that's one of the reasons why we are here. We would love to hear what your thoughts are on what points are we missing. And we'll be back with our engineer for an additional amount of money to uh, talk about, okay, which way do we go through this roadmap? Obviously, at the very top, uh, pretty much agreed by the Building and Grounds Committee, will be proposed to the vestry. Um, let's install a proper water treatment system. The quality of the water that we are pumping into our heating system is dangerous, dangerous to the heating system. That's not a good position to be in. So this is pretty much a given as far as the uh, Building and Grounds Committee is concerned. We've got to install that treatment system, and we hope that the vestry will approve it before long. Now we get into a number of different paths, and let's start here on the left. Rated critical by our engineer is to replace the condensate return pipes. That is uh, where he suspects that a uh, big leak a year ago occurred. We don't know. Nobody was here to uh, watch it. And it seems to have plugged itself as mysteriously <laughs> as it uh, leaked. <clears throat> and then uh, comes uh, as a potential follow-on project um, to uh, convert to a hot water system, still using the peerless boiler with a heat exchanger or heat coupler. And eventually, and uh, I can't see it on my screen, but you can see it here, you know, somewhere down in the future, uh, we have confirmed with our engineer that could uh, be converted to a uh, 
heat pump with gas back up. So that's the technically feasible path. Another path would be to convert to hot water, which means all the piping, outbound condensate return, which no longer is condensate return, but hot water return and radiators, and still continue to use the peerless boiler via a heat exchanger to heat the system. And again, that eventually uh, should allow us, uh, when the, the peerless boiler reaches end of life, to replace it and uh, heat the water directly. Now it gets tricky. I mentioned that the uh, peerless boiler, in the best estimate of our engineer, it's probably three times the size of what we need. But we don't know, is it two times the size, two and a half times the size, three times, three and a half, you get the idea. We, we know it is hugely oversized, but we don't know how much. So one of the discussion points we have with our engineer is um, we got to establish the heating load that we actually require. And he suggests there are two ways we can do that. One, we can install a BTU meter in the system. We would do this only for the PLS steam system, not for the Trinity House hot water system. Okay, that's one way. If for some reason we can't uh, get that installed, he would be willing to do an engineering analysis for us and uh, you know, do his best to calculate heat load and required uh, heating system output and so on. And uh, either one of these costs money. There's no magic here. Get getting good data is going to cost us money. And then we've got uh, a number of options here. <clears throat> Depending on how much heat we actually require in these three buildings, is there a possibility that the two blue boilers that uh, Rob showed you earlier, could they support four buildings? Or if they cannot support four buildings, just how much quote unquote gap heat do we actually need to support the uh four there? What's the fourth building? Um Jim. Oh. Yep. Uh, on the Google Maps, uh, that's the uh, top end of the parish house. Just a quick clarification. <clears throat> Are these three times the size we need based on the space and the climate? Or is it space based on our use? based on space and climate. So you're saying that when they put that in there, they put it in three times the size it needed. Steam does not work efficiently when it's oversized yeah. or undersized. Yeah, absolutely agreed. So we, we need to do something about that. Okay, that's, that's so, part of understanding just how much heat do we need in there. And that we don't understand why we put in such a big boiler. Well, back back when we put it in, we wanted to get the heat in the church up to speed quick. That's a use issue. That's yeah. a use issue. Either it's a space issue or it's a use issue. Yeah. And uh, careful yep, the two of them are not separate. You know, an oversized boiler. Uh, bringing in, you know, I forget how hot that thing goes. Uh, steam definitely above two twelve. That's you no, know, that's a given for steam. Um, that puts out a lot of heat in the radiators, and in turn, it heats the church building quickly. Okay, so this this excess capacity is useful when uh, I don't know who turns on the thermostats on Saturdays. Is it you, Dave? I used to turn it on now. Uh, now the heat runs 24 7. So it's yeah. running, the heat in the church is running for some okay. days a week yeah. rather than just for Sunday morning. Yep. So there's no a change in use that's important. Uh, so that, that, no, there was a change in use. Back, back when the system was installed, it was only being run on Sundays or on when, uh, Sundays and Wednesdays. Yeah. So that I was using it. Is that so that the organ stays in tune? Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, but. Um, that seems to have been just a problem in the last 10 years of needing to be um, 
you know, it never was before. Yeah. So, okay. Never so, was a problem before. Yeah. So there's another good question for the Building and like Grounds it's, Committee it's, to it's poke a, into. <laughs> Every time we meet, and that's why we meet, it gets more complicated. And at this stage, that's good. When you say when you say that the sanctuary is being heated seven days a week, are you saying at the same level? Yes. So it's not cut back at all. We're not going down to sixty-four on the maintenance level. Correct. Well, there's something to and think we about. Have the thermostats in there installed that would allow us to do that. Is that is that another? We're not using. Is that another of our options for? Yeah. There's a permutation. Yeah. Yeah. And thank you for bringing that up because we didn't know that. That will affect the organ. Yeah. But, but a few okay. degrees shouldn't make that much difference. 50 years well, beforehand. Yeah. And, and, and we don't know what the organ is kept at the same level. Yeah. So there, there's, there's something for us to uh, look into. And so, yeah. Dave will be uh, asking for history as much as yeah. you know it, please. Yeah. And thank you. <clears throat> so, you know, depending on the load analysis that we get, there's a question, could we uh, heat those three buildings in addition to Trinity House with the two uh, blue Budero spoilers? That could be a very tight fit. Right so now, the, the blue Buderos are, are pushed to their limits. Okay. There, there's some days where everybody's in here and it's struggling to you know, there's rooms that are not getting up to temperature. But that's that's good to know because that's another thing that we were not sure about. And uh, I know that also that I think that pretty much says these two paths are not going to get us very far because uh, you know the uh, using the Budiris boilers uh, to heat anything back there probably not going to get us very far based on David's input. Uh, a question. Um, all of Everything that you said about the um, the piping and the radiators were on the first option on the left. You didn't talk about that after. In fact, all of the others is converting to hot water. Yeah. So, so uh, is the uh, is the piping an absolute necessity? Is that one of the things also that has to be done? Yeah. Uh, and also, then, basically, is the decision that uh, we will be dropping the radiators and going to hot water. It looks as though all of the other um, hot water would also have radiators. Different radiators. But not the steam radiators. Eh? Not the steam radiators, yeah. And basically uh, what we're saying here is stage it. First replace the condensate return piping, which uh, as far as anyone can tell is uh, the most exposed and the highest risk of a catastrophic failure. And then follow that up by uh, converting to a hot water system and uh, keep you know, the return piping at that time just built on top of that. And this basically says, do it all in one fell swoop. And what struck us that is that these two together come out to roughly the same cost as doing it all in one fell swoop. These are engineering estimates. And if you've worked with engineers, um, you know, uh, there, there's a word of caution that our engineer wants us to be aware of. These are not contractor estimates, but they are his best estimates uh, on what a contractor might come with, with a little extra risk allowance uh, for things changing by the time a contractor comes up. These two together um, are in the engineering estimates about a quarter million. This one uh, is about 20,000 more. As, as our engineer keeps reminding us, these are engineering estimates. They are not contractor bids. And uh, if we are looking you know, at these two, compare these two cost, first cost-wise, remember that first cost bit I mentioned earlier? It's, I've got nothing about operations yet. This is just the first cost. For most purposes, we can consider these two first cost estimates for this and this or that about the same, okay? So uh, <clears throat> in any case, an intermediate stage before we you know, pass on to our successor some number of years down the road, an intermediate stage 
involves converting to a hot water system. But we don't quite know yet uh, how big a hot water system. Uh, we got to talk about that usage question that just came up. Um, and eventually, there are other paths in the future, or other possibilities in the future that, as I said many times, we don't want to block by uh, what we do now, unless we agree a particular path in the future is just totally useless. It, it seems as though we're probably not unique in this situation where we have an older system that's doing steam that's going to have to be converted. There are a lot of larger buildings that are going to be in the same situation. Um, it, and it also seems to me that down the line, when we get to that 15 year or whatever that, that, that we're converting to, that those systems will be designed to help the people who converted now. I don't know if that makes any sense. So it seems to me we need to stay in the same path that they are using for other buildings are mm -hmm. sized and converting from steam in order to be viable for the retrograde that will happen in 15 years. Yeah. That's precisely, you know, why we are coming up with here are all kinds of roadmaps. So we're looking outside at what other buildings are doing and what the what the trends are for eating. We are relying on our engineer to keep us honest on that. Okay. We have not gone out uh, to other facilities and asked, what are you guys doing? Well, I would imagine he would have a better handle on yeah. it. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's, that's where we simply rely on him. Right, right. And uh, uh, so I don't forget that he put together a report, 270 pages or something like that. There's an 18 page executive summary if anybody wants the executive summary or the full report as a PDF, no, we don't print that. Um, let uh, Rob or me know. And uh, please remind me, Rick, so we don't forget because I'm not taking notes right now. Um, so that, uh, you know, that knowledge is spread in the congregation. I don't want to put them publicly on the web. There's a ton of expertise <clears throat> in uh, that document or engineers' expertise, and I, I don't want to put that publicly on the web for somebody else to abscond with and say, hey, look what they are doing, maybe we could. Uh -uh. But for anybody at Trinity who is interested in uh, seeing that uh, analysis, absolutely. Okay, that's not a secret amongst us. So here I've uh, added you know, some of the costs, as we know, I missed, missed that one. Um, as I said, these two together, come in around a uh, quarter million, a little bit above, not far away from what this one would cost us, which gives us a completely new system. And except for the usual, gee, it's a new system. There's a leak over there, kinds of problems, a uh, essentially problem-free system for a while to come. And uh, these numbers, you no know, 1B, 1A, and uh, in a final version, I added a few more numbers, they tie back to the to specific proposals in that engineering report. So uh, I'm happy to send out these charts too with those small corrections, you know, like this is uh, 2A <clears throat> and the dollar number on it. So you can compare the roadmap of where we might possibly go with uh, the uh, specific proposals uh, that our engineer put together. Other than that, there's nothing new uh, on this particular chart. <clears throat> Again, some important numbers. Uh, these are rough engineering estimates. Okay, uh, These are not based on uh, precisely knowing how much gas the Buderos boilers burn for uh, the Trinity House and how much the Peerless burns for the uh, rest of our campus. These are rough engineering estimates. And again, 1A, 2B, these are specific proposals in the engineering report. So you can tie that back to the executive summary and the details behind it if you wish, but that there is something that stands out immediately. Energy consumption systems two and four are certainly 
much more attractive than one and three from an energy consumption perspective. And system two is hot water, high efficiency boilers. Okay, system four is uh, water treatment. And I, uh, I should have added that in here too, but uh, water treatment, as I said, is pretty much a given as far as building and grounds is concerned and replace all piping and radiators and use the existing boilers, including the PLS. So based on a very rough engineering analysis, continuing use of the PLS boiler might be a little bit higher than uh, using uh, new condensing hot water uh, boilers. But that's... Let's see, the purple is heating, pump, and fan electric. Cooling yellow is not on any of these for obvious reasons. Uh, this uh, tan orange is uh, electric heat. Um, the purple is cooling electric. Again, uh, we've got very, very little of that. Red is fossil heat. And that is, in our case, obviously the big one. That's what we do right now. And that's uh, what uh, uh, these four systems would do going forward. This one is actually uh, electric. And uh, much of that, of what that bar um, is made up of, of course, depends on where is it coming from? Does the electricity come from a fossil fuel plant? Does it come from a solar farm? Does it come from a solar a set of solar panels and on top of the parish house and gym, which has a beautiful flat roof with a southern exposure? And nothing to the left and right, east and west, that gets that throws shade on it. Well, really late, maybe uh, our bell tower. But you get the idea. That's not part of our discussion at this stage. But as I said earlier, when I talked about the uh, creation care challenges, where the energy comes from is something that the Building and Grounds Committee is also keeping in mind. We are not just cleaning up the footprint in this building, but we are also keeping in mind where does the energy come from and what's the potential footprint there. Now, life cycle cost. Again, very rough engineering estimates. And we really need uh, you know, to get those uh, firmed up and refined. <clears throat> but um, now taking into account the uh, first cost, which is the yellow bar, the cost of bringing the system into the building initially. And uh, the picture changes a little bit, but again, system two and system four are potentially the winners here. They are less expensive uh, to put in and less expensive to operate than uh, the other alternatives considered here. Okay, so that's again early uh, and a rough engineering estimate, and we need to validate that in uh, greater detail, which gets us back to this uh, mysterious uh, stuff in the top right of the uh, roadmap. We got to know what we are actually putting into the building heat-wise. That will allow us uh, to refine these numbers to a point where we can take it to the vestry and the congregation and say, look, this is what we're actually running up. This is what it's taking. And based on understanding what it's taking, here is what we propose, Building Grounds Committee, to go forward with. So this, this becomes a very important uh, step, helping us understand uh, what we are doing. And I don't mean to badmouth uh, our predecessors, you know, uh, 50, 60 plus years ago or 15, 14 years ago when the peerless boiler was replaced. They did what was then considered to be a good system. They had a good, good system put in place or a key component of a good system, the peerless boiler, replaced with a good boiler. That was the right thing to do back then. In hindsight, we know um, something a little different might have been better yet. 
but it was good at the time. And I don't mean to knock our uh, predecessors for the choices they made, but we all understand with a rapidly changing heating environment, heating technology environment around us and rapidly changing heat sources, whether it's pumped from here to there or generated uh, through resistance coils, hopefully not, it's expensive, or uh, gas backups, this field is changing rapidly. So it's important for us to uh, keep in mind not to bind the hands of our predecessors you know, 10, 15 years down the road or give them something solid on which they can build as opposed to saying, boy, if only they had. What were they thinking? Yeah. Well, some, some of what was going on, the, the state-of-the-art systems back then were not totally dependable. They weren't tried and true. And what we went with for the peer list yeah. was, you know, it was, yeah, we knew it was going to work. Yeah, it was a good decision at the time. And I want to be clear on that nobody is questioning <laughs> that decision or the quality of that decision. It was a good decision at the time. But how does this, that song go? The times, they are a changing. Can anybody do that on command? I can't. <clears throat> but you get the idea. I mean, things are changing rapidly. Uh, five years ago, a heat pump, not that reliable, not that effective. <laughs> It's changing rapidly, and you know, if you watch uh, what's coming out of uh, development labs and universities, it's continuing to change rapidly. That's why, you know, for us on the Building and Grounds Committee, do something prudent that the next generation can build on is something that's, <clears throat> that's so important to us. We don't want, you know, if, if we end up spending a quarter million bucks on a brand new heating system, that's a huge expense. And we don't want to you know, create a, a situation where um, 15 years down the road, the next generation of leaders looks at that and said, oh boy, we got to start over. So they, there are some funding possibilities that we have looked at. And uh, if anybody knows of more, we are all ears. Uh, New York State, obviously, if you listen to uh, the governor's uh, state of the state address, she is pushing um, all kinds of uh, energy initiatives. And uh, one that uh, we started finding out about uh, last December, actually, is uh, local utility, NYSEC in our case, um, is uh, running a program where they will... Uh, <clears throat> cover up to 50% of the first cost, but the up to uh, very likely depends on just what are you putting in. Um, they also offer a uh, you know, brief consulting job, a walkthrough and a brief consultant, and uh, said, okay, building a project will take that. We've applied for the program and uh, we're awaiting approval to be in the program. They got swamped, which in a sense is good news, but the deadlines the state is putting they were performed. Yeah. So uh, this is uh, you know, I think funded by the state, but uh, they went public with this program. There's a comparable program for residences in the, incidentally, if somebody's interested. Um they went public with that in December and uh, they got swamped. <clears throat> Another one that we have been able to find, uh, Susan Sherwood found that one for us, is known as the Fund for Sacred Places. Um, very interesting uh, funding model. They don't fund a lot of uh, projects each year, 12 to 15. And as it turns out, St. Paul's in Syracuse uh, got a grant in 2019. And it's worthwhile knowing what they did. They didn't do an energy project. They converted one of their buildings into a moderate and low income housing. We do have some empty or unused rooms in our campus, don't we? But that's another discussion. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Okay. And this but you know that isn't enough of discussion. Because I think somehow or another in the in the process of determining what we need, we need to look at what can be used. Mm -hmm. How can we, you know, is there a way to shut down mm -hmm. spaces mm -hmm. we yeah. don't use? Would it be worthwhile demolishing a building? Would it, I mean, you yeah. know, I think that's part of the whole discussion. Well, there's such a huge, there, it's an ongoing discussion amongst all of us who rent now. There's a huge dearth of apartment buildings. There are not enough apartments for people in this in this area where we live. There's there's a, a six to nine month waiting list, you know, and that's just one building. Yeah. So mentioning that is a good idea, bringing it up because, you know, what I think that's what they did was smart. Well, at the very least, looking at what we really use a lot, Absolutely, you know, yeah. even separate from what might be. Yeah. Looking at what we actually use and how much we use it makes sense. How much empty space there is, right? How much is not um, used at all? You know, to get back, you know, I really thought uh, what St. Paul's in Syracuse did here was, wow, um, a very radical change, a very radical uh, change in their mission. And uh, it clearly caught uh, the, uh, the eyes of uh, the Fund for Sacred Places. I think, and you know, the link is uh, in soft copy. He says as he waves the hard copy. Um, I think that project ran half a million to convert that building. It was huge. And uh, uh, Fund for Sacred Places uh, funded 50% uh, for them. There's a, the other thing is, if this makes sense, there's a difference between long-range planning, which Joan is really talking about and chasing a grant and you know when i was in the field one of the things i always cautioned the nonprofits about was chasing a grant you know do, turning yourself inside out to get the money so somewhere in between is a wise place to be but you do have to be careful yeah and uh, you know if you remember uh you know this chart uh the two grant sources that we are aware of right now and again uh, if there are more we are all ears. They would tackle the yellow portion of what's on this chart. We continue to pay 100% of all the other colors, which is the ongoing uh, cost of operations. So I think, you know, to, to make your point uh, for you again, just because you get a grant uh, doesn't mean uh, that uh, you're now home free. It helps with a portion of the problem that we are trying to chase down. But nor do you want to pick a solution because it's the solution that would get you the grant. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yep. yeah. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, I think that's particularly the case uh, in the New York's uh, in the NYSEC program. We don't know yet what types of projects they fund with uh, what percentage. Um, now, if we end up with uh, replacing the uh, steam system with a hot water system, better sized, better operated for our needs, and we reduce our energy consumption by a good chunk, would they consider that? Or is that not green enough? We don't know. I mean, that's, that's why we're interested in uh, having the consultant of theirs talk to us and uh, learn what we have learned and tell us uh, what it looks like from their perspective. And the consultant doesn't, uh, doesn't, they don't charge for that? Right. That, that consultant uh, visit, it's nothing like our engineering study, but it's free. So we'll take it. <laughs> but, uh, you know, if uh, that consultant, for the sake of argument, tells us, no, the only thing uh, you're going to get funding from us is uh, if you go to a you know, heat pump electric system, then our answers might be, thank you, we'll talk to you again in five years or ten years. We need to understand that because the cost of operating, again, this is estimated, you know, based on uh, 25000 a year without knowing where precisely uh, that heat money is spent, this building, the other buildings. Um, we don't want to be stuck with that. That's, that's the wrong direction to go. It was great for Rob to say that he didn't know about all this stuff. And I know how much you've learned because he's been teaching me. 
Um, but it's, we need to know absolutely everything, like the usage and the size and is it, should it be run seven days a week or should it only be run Sundays and Wednesdays, right? We didn't know that. Yeah. And uh, I think just uh, for the record, we're into overtime, but we've got a great discussion going here. So those who can stay a little longer, please do. Um, I don't, I'm don't. i not sure that we've heard all the good uh, insight and uh, questions that we can generate. Rick. You mentioned the $25,000 annual cost of energy again. Does that include the 81,000 uh, 81, gallons of water that mysteriously disappeared? No, that's water. That's not uh, energy. Now, for those on remote, the comment was, uh, no, that's water under the bridge. <laughs> Is there yes. a significant difference in the data you would get from the engineering report as opposed to a BTU meter? Uh, the quality of the data, yes. There is. Um, our engineer you know, would love to do the uh, analysis for us. And uh, the uh, BTU meter, we've got one estimate, uh, seven, is about seven and a half K, if seven. memory serves me. It said seven. Seven, seven K. <clears throat> and he said, you know, if I did the analysis for you, it would probably cost you a little less. But he is pushing us to consider the BTU meter as our first option because the quality of the data becomes impeccable. No longer a, how much insulation is in that wall? And the wind blows from that direction uh, this often and that speed and that temperature, you know, all the wonderful things that a professional engineer uh, has at their fingertips and can put into an equation, into a calculation. Doesn't matter. A BTU meter would give us uh, an actual measure and data on uh, heat put into the building. Would that BTU meter do the overall? Or would it, in, in other words, I'm wondering, I'm, 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 I'm listening to what Joan said about an assessment of what parts of the building are we using or what not using. If we were to come up with 30% of the building that we only use occasionally, and we were to put that on a zone, for instance, that could be, that, it, it, that didn't need to be heated fully, um, would that be to you um, adjustment? Would that be to you meter? account for that type of thing, closing down portions. Yes, uh, the uh, BTU meter is heating system wide. So there would be one meter, we've got two systems, okay. but one meter for the steam system. And if we then you know, uh, shut down, say the third floor in the parish house, which I think is close to where we are, um, then uh, the meter says, oh, yes, just a moderate amount of heat going into the system. And uh, it doesn't know that it's the third floor of the parish house that's not absorbing heat. It just knows there's less heat oh, going so into the system. Yep. And then my piggyback on that is, does that then mean if, if we do find enough savings of heat within our current facilities, does that mean the two boilers, the top water boilers that we've had, would then become enough to heat the, the uh, you know, what we have determined we want to do. Yeah, that is one of the questions we are pursuing. And, you know, based on David's comment earlier that there are days when uh, the two boilers uh, struggle to keep the Trinity House warm, which is all they do at present, it may not be enough. Yeah. But it still begs the question if, you know, the heating season isn't all zero degrees Fahrenheit with uh, blustery northwest winds. The heating season is also 45 and 50 degrees out there, and we just need a trickle of heat. So, you know, that there is a, another balance to be struck here. Uh, our engineer refers to these, you know, 40, 50 degree days as the heating season shoulders, where a much smaller system would do the trick. So that's another one of these uh, questions where we don't quite know yet uh, where they will appear in the roadmap and how they will uh, get answered. But the possibility that for much of the heating system, the two group could do the job for the whole campus. 
But then on the coldest days, we need something to expand their capability. That's one of the questions we've raised with them. And that's where this BTU meter and this load analysis keeps coming back in. Something else that I don't recall being mentioned today on the steam system, um, well, or the, or the hot water, is that we do have zones. The hot water system is newer and has much more distinct, well-defined, well, much more manageable zones. Um, the steam heat does have zones also. Uh, one of the zones, well, two of the zones are the sanctuary. There's a zone on either side of it. And then there's a zone for the gym and a zone for the, what do you call it, the office wing, the, the upstairs floor mm -hmm. of the office wing. Uh, so we can shut down different zones. We have the, the temperatures regulated on those zones at, lower, at some lower temperatures. Uh, another beauty of steam heat was that if we shut it off totally, there's no water in the pipes. On a hot water system, we shut it off totally, then we're going to have a problem if we go below zero um, and there's no heat in that. Uh, in, in, in an exposed way. We know somebody who bought the new, brand new house, and I mean, the hot they moved in in May, and Christmas Day that happened. They had exposed pipes, mm -hmm. no heat. The the whoever put it in, Peter, when he heard the whole story, he was like, "It's brand new," you know. Yep. And they, that's what they determined what, and they had no heat. So, that's why they didn't find it sooner. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but on the Christmas day, they were a little yep. cold. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I remember 1984, no, 85, 86 in North Carolina, cold wave, and everybody's uh, water and heating pipes were exposed in the open crawl spaces. Got lucky. Mm -hmm. Our furnace was in the open crawl space, so that spread enough heat around. We didn't lose uh, any pipes, Same but a around. lot of folks were not as fortunate. Yeah. Lots of broken pipes and lots of time before the plumbers could get to all of them. So the zoning, thank you again, very important point uh, that uh, you know helps regulate the heat consumption in the buildings. And it gets us potentially closer to the right sized system. Probably three heat sources, two wood aerosols and something else, but it gets us closer to uh, a system that meets our needs and that is uh, affordable to operate uh, for a couple decades to come. Before I leave, I just want to say what I think would be echoed by everybody here that uh, Rob is chair in the Building and Grounds Committee, Michael and David, tremendous amounts of thanks. Uh, there's yes, so much yeah, talent yes. in this church. There's so much talent. And that certainly has been an important uh, mm -hmm. part of it over the past year or two. It's incredible. The amount thanks. of work that they've Thank put you. into yeah. all of them. Thank you, Judy. We learned an awful lot and lots of new vocabulary. <laughs> all right. So again, for the folks remote, if you want a copy of any of the materials, uh, drop uh, Rob or myself an email. We are in the directory and uh, we'll get a, a copy of uh, these materials to you. Thanks so much. Thank you.